Before I get into this, I want to give you a warning. What I'm going to show you today is more than likely going to make you feel absolutely furious. But this is something that affects everyone, and I think that you need to know what's going on here. I am, of course, referring to house prices. If you've ever dabbled in psychology before, you'll know that one of the first concepts you'll come across is Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. This pyramid defines what makes people happy by categorizing people's desires. The most important desires are those at the bottom, such as air, water and food, which are essential just to even survive. When those desires are achieved, we can then move upwards and get onto things such as security, employment, friendship, intimacy, respect and self-esteem, until finally reaching the top of the hierarchy, self-actualization, whereby it is here that people are said to reach true happiness. And you may have noticed that one of the desires that is considered to be essential is shelter, which of course it is. After all, how can you feel secure in life if you're homeless and have nowhere to call your own? How can you be employed when you need an address to open a bank account in order to get paid? How can you have a partner and raise a family when you have no word to raise them? Shelter is not something that is optional for human beings, but a requirement just to even function. Yet houses are of course hugely expensive. Very few people who just moved out of their parents' place can afford to immediately purchase a house outright. So, what do people do? Well, they of course get a little something called a mortgage. Banks buy up houses outright and let people live in them, whereby said people then pay off a set monetary sum to the bank every month, whereby over the period of around 20 years or so, they will have paid for the house in its entirety. And that house will now be theirs. Despite being a corrupt system in of itself, for many decades, it worked quite great, with millions of people around the world slowly owning their own properties which in turn gave themselves huge amounts of security and stability, while at the same time ensuring that their next of kin had something to inherit. However, in recent years, many young people in their 20s and 30s have found it borderline impossible to even pay the required down payment for a mortgage, never mind paying it in its entirety. And the reason for this is that house prices have absolutely surged to the point of ludicrous unaffordability for the average person. But why? Well, the truth is, there isn't just one reason why house prices have gone up, but three that I like to call the free eyes. Inflation, investors, and immigration. Let's start with inflation. Forget houses for a moment. Those of you who have been shopping for anything lately, whether for food or gas, have probably noticed that the price of almost all goods and services have absolutely skyrocketed in recent months. Many people have blamed such price hikes on certain politicians they don't like, whether left-wing or right-wing. But the truth is that this simply isn't the case. The real reason why the prices for everything are going through the roof is that fundamentally, our economic system is completely corrupt to the core, especially when it comes to dealing with an unexpected crisis. For example, in early 2020, a pandemic began, whereby governments told their people that in the interests of public health, national lockdowns were to be implemented as to limit potential infections. As such, people in professions whereby it was possible to work from home, such as office workers, had their working arrangements changed as to ensure that they could still work despite such newfound circumstances. However, there were also many people who were in professions whereby it was simply impossible to work from home. A builder, for example, can't exactly build from their bedroom. However, pandemic or not, such people still have bills to pay and mouths to feed. And so what governments decided to do is to give such people a furlough, which is essentially a form of temporary welfare payment as to cover their lost earnings while they were unable to work. Well, sounds good so far. The problem, however, is that the money to fund such expensive furlough schemes obviously has to come from somewhere. 
But governments don't actually produce any economic value themselves. They merely harvest money from individuals via taxes and then allocate such funds as they see fit. However, in such times of crisis, such as a pandemic, there is of course less tax available to harvest, as there is simply less people in employment who can pay such taxes. Yet at the same time, there is a higher demand for government spending in order to fund such furlough schemes, and the obvious increase in healthcare spending that comes with such a scenario. Essentially, the supply of tax money was lower than usual, but the demand for government spending was higher than usual. So, what did our central banks decide to do to pay for such demands? They simply printed more money. Yeah. To visualise this, here is a graph of the M1 money supply of the United States. As you can see, the supply remained relatively stable up until February 2020, whereby it absolutely went through the roof. But you're probably thinking, well yeah, that graph looks pretty bad, but it only goes back three years. I'm sure it's not that bad, right? But it doesn't matter if you go back 10 years, 25 years, or even 50 years. As you can see, there has never been as many US dollars in circulation than now, and not by a large margin. Even the economic crisis of 2008 looks completely insignificant in comparison. But, so what? I mean, how does this affect prices? Isn't having more dollars in circulation a good thing? No, no it isn't. For example, if I put you on an island with a handful of people, and only gave them one dollars each, but gave you and you only a hundred dollars, that would mean that you'd be a hundred times richer than everyone else on the island, and as such, you'd have a huge amount of purchasing power. But if the next day, I gave everyone else a thousand dollars while giving you nothing, then even though the amount of money you have, a hundred dollars, has not changed, because everyone else is now suddenly far richer, your $100 is now worth far less than it was yesterday. This is because the value of your money isn't just determined by how much you have, but also how much everyone else has in comparison. And so, if back in 2019 you had, say, $1,000 in the bank and did nothing with it, then today, you will still have $1,000 in the bank, but whether you like it or not, that $1,000 is now worth less, because there's more dollars out there in circulation. What this means is that essentially, every time our central banks print more money, you factually get poorer. Welcome to the wild world of inflation. And so, on paper, it's not so much that prices are actually going up, but that the purchasing power of each individual dollar is simply going down. And when I put it that way, it doesn't sound that bad. But it is still bad, because wages aren't keeping up with inflation, and so in effect, everyone is still getting screwed over. For example, if an Alex Hexagon Funko Pop ugh, costed just one dollars each, and you got paid ten dollars an hour, then that means that you could buy 10 Alex Hexagon Funko Pops for every hour that you worked. What a bargain! But if, due to inflation, the price went up to $1.25, but you still only got paid $10 an hour, well then now, you could only buy 8 per hour. The horror! Now with small items such as in the Funko Pop example, if the price went up by 25%, then that's not really that bad, as after all, it's only an increase of 25 cents per unit. Big deal! But if something like, oh, I don't know, a house goes up by 25% in price, then that's an increase of tens of thousands of dollars. Tens of thousands of dollars that most people simply can't afford. Inflation is great in the short term, as the economy keeps chugging along and no one notices it. Well, until a few months later, when suddenly the prices for everything start to skyrocket. For the few among you who are curious about what the central bank should have done instead of inflation, you can pause to read this extraordinarily boring idea that I had, that I won't bother voicing over, as it would probably make you go to sleep. So you're probably thinking at this point that, wow, currencies like the dollar, euro and pound are really unstable investments. And yeah, it's almost like fiat currencies that aren't tied to any commodity and can be inflated to oblivion overnight aren't worth saving 
as toilet paper. That's why a lot of wealthy people instead like to diversify their wealth into actual tangible assets, such as gold and silver, that, at least until cloning comes into effect, will pretty much always retain some level of value. But do you want to know what's an even better asset than even precious metals? Houses. Which brings us on to the second eye. Investors. Houses, or just property in general, is by far one of the most lucrative investments a person can hold. Why? Because like precious metals, a house will always inherently have value. Because, well, it's a house. But unlike precious metals, you can also make some money out of it while still owning it, by simply renting it out. Have you ever heard of an AMC before? AMC stands for Asset Management Company. Investors pay AMCs to invest their money into numerous different assets, such as shares in companies, in the hopes to increase their wealth, of which the AMC will of course take a cut. There are many AMCs all around the world that handle billions of dollars in assets. However, the largest AMCs in the world don't just deal in the billions, but the trillions. Trillions with a T. The largest AMC in the world is BlackRock, who has over $10 trillion worth of assets under its management. For reference, the gross domestic product of my entire country, the United Kingdom, is just over $3 trillion. That means that BlackRock has more assets under its belt than three and a half United Kingdoms. In fact, BlackRock alone is said to accommodate around 10% of all global finances. 10% of the entire world under one company. And remember, BlackRock is just one of many AMCs. Vanguard Group, their closest competitor, is worth almost as much as them. Recently, AMCs like BlackRock and other investors have been buying up a ton of houses, whereby they then hold onto them and rent them out to individuals. According to John Burns Real Estate Consulting, one in five houses sold in the United States top housing markets is now purchased by someone who will never move into the house, aka an investor. And this correlates well with Redfin analysis of American county housing records, whereby here we can see that in the year 2000, less than 6% of American homes were bought by investors. But by 2021, this number has more than tripled to a whopping 18.2%, the highest number since records began. At the same time, US home ownership rates have absolutely plummeted, and have been for years. According to the British government, there are now more households in the UK that are renters than mortgage holders or homeowners, by a significant margin. And this statistic is even more striking when you break it down by age. When it comes to people who are over 75, 79% own their own home or have a mortgage, whereas just 21% are renters. Meanwhile, when it comes to people aged between 16 to 24, only 9% own their own home or have a mortgage, whereas 91% are renters. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, yeah, I mean, that's how it's meant to work. Obviously, people who are young won't own their own homes yet, whereas people who are old will. But that's not the surprising part. The surprising part is how few young people today are actually getting mortgages at all. When it comes to the 25 to 34 demographic, which is when people typically get a mortgage, only 43% of people actually have, whereas 57% of people are still renting. Even if I was to raise the bar by 10 years to the 35 to 44 demographic, the amount of renters is still a staggering 45%. The UK and other Western countries are quickly becoming nations of renters, made up of the haves and the have-nots. The haves being made up of rich people, who can simply buy whatever they please, as well as older people, who managed to snag a property back when the housing market actually made sense. The have-nots, on the other hand, are made up of poor people, who can barely afford food, never mind a house, and young people, who were simply priced out the market before they were even born. Gee, this is terrible. I bet our media is outraged about this. Bloomberg. America should become a nation of renters. What? 
Rising real estate prices are stoking fears that home ownership, long considered a core component of the American dream, is slipping out of reach for low and moderate income Americans. That may be so, but a nation of renters is not something to fear. In fact, it's the opposite. Uh, no. I mean, I don't know about you, but I think that most people would rather own their own house. To see the US as a nation of renters requires a revision of the American dream of home ownership. This country was always more about new frontiers than comfortable settlements anyway. Well, Americans, you heard it here first. Don't bother trying to own your own home. <laughs> no, no, that's so 20th century. Just rent instead. It's the new American way. But who the hell trusts Bloomberg when it comes to matters of finance anyway? I mean, these guys are all about investing. Let's check out a more left-wing website instead. Vox. Everyone wants to blame BlackRock. No one wants to blame low supply, low mortgage rates, and enormous demand for starter homes. Wait, Vox? Isn't Vox that far-left American news site that's run by a bunch of blue-herd wokists? What are they doing defending BlackRock? Hmm. Well, let's see here. Vox is owned by Vox Media, who in December 2014 raised $46.5 million, led by the growth equity firm General Atlantic. The CEO of General Atlantic is a man by the name of William E. Ford, who just so happens to sit on the board of BlackRock. Oh well, that's not a conflict of interest at all. Yes, as per usual with these so-called left-wing news websites, they only seem to exist in order to foster divisive and distractionary identity politics issues as to make the naive youth believe they are some sort of social justice revolutionary. When in reality, these Che Guevara wannabes are fed by the same wealthy corporate hand that they claim to despise. The Economist How an obsession with home ownership can ruin the economy. Excuse me? An obsession with home ownership? What do you mean, obsession? What next? An obsession with breathing oxygen? An obsession with drinking water? What? But why is there this pressure to get on the property ladder? People don't really question the idea that home ownership is a good thing. It's something that they've always been told and uh, assume is, it must be true. Uh, no. No one is told that owning a house is a good thing. It's common sense. It is a good thing. The obsession with home ownership has had unintended consequences, which have not only distorted the housing market, but brought the financial system to its knees. The realization of the American dream, the envy of the entire world. I have never seen a more disingenuous piece of propaganda in my life. The fact that these people are trying to imply that the 2008 Lehman Brothers crash was caused by people wanting to own their own homes is not just a flat-out lie, but frankly, a shameful attempt at deception. The 2008 crash was caused by greedy bankers giving out mortgages like candy to people they knew would default on them. The 2008 crash wasn't caused by the poor, it was caused by the rich. And gee, I wonder who owns The Economist. Is it poor people or rich people? Well, let's see. As it turns out, a combination of barons, billionaire businessmen, and even more AMCs. Shocking. Granted, it shouldn't be particularly surprising that the owners of a media company called The Economist are wealthy. After all, nobody wants to take fiscal advice from a homeless person. But it really begs into question, do all these billionaires really have our best interests at heart? No, obviously not. While the wealthy live in huge mansions, they want you to rent for life. While the wealthy pollute our planet, they want you to sacrifice for them. While the wealthy eat the finest of foods, they want you to eat insects. No, really. In 2017, not a single person on Earth had a net worth over $100 billion. Five years later in 2022, an 8 out of the top 10 do. Yeah, something tells me that letting billionaires buy out all of our media probably wasn't a wise idea after all. There's a reason why small one-man channels like mine, who this platform was made for in the first place, have to rely on the generosity of viewers manually sharing our productions via word of mouth, 
Meanwhile, billionaire-owned enterprises like The Economist have the algorithm spread their nonsense to the masses far and wide. And that reason is that all these wealthy corporates seem to scratch each other's backs, desperately trying to normalise their financial oppression over the masses. The countries in dark and light blue have no restrictions on foreign investors buying up their land, whereas those in red forbid it outright. Notice how only China and India protect their people from predatory corporations, whereas the western states mostly don't even try. Could it be because the governments who rule over these states always put the interests of big business first over their own citizens? Yes. Yes they do. Any competent government would flat out prevent asset managers from buying a single property within their nations, and all investors, both foreign and domestic for that matter. Houses are not an investment, something that can be used to leverage the poor out of what little cash they have. Houses are a fundamental requirement to even exist on this earth. It is a nation state's duty to ensure that its citizens have access to safe and affordable housing, not let trillion dollar companies waltz in and steal from their own citizens. If you want to know how little western politicians actually care about their own citizens, then you need look no further than this clip. Canada, being under the iron grip of the Trudeau government, has suffered greatly, with their house prices surging to levels never before seen. In the Canadian House of Commons, a politician by the name of Pierre Polyev attempted to ask a member of the Trudeau government why house prices have gone up so much. Let's count how many times he avoids answering such a simple question. For the Minister of Middle Class Prosperity, who is a member of Parliament here in Ottawa, what is the average cost for a home in the city of Ottawa? The Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my uh, title is the Minister of Tourism and Associate Minister of Finance. I'm sure my honourable colleague across the way knows that. But let me say, Mr. Speaker, 156,000 jobs. The Honourable Member for Carleton. The uh, Minister of Treasury Board uh, can uh, help uh, by telling us the average cost of a house in uh, the, the nation's capital. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to say 106% of jobs have been recovered since the lowest point of the pandemic. Member for Carleton. What is the uh, average increase in house prices since this government took, house, uh, took office uh, uh, in 2015? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canada's economy contracted by 17% between February and April 2020, the largest and most sudden contraction in real GDP since the Great Depression, and we're already back. Well, member for Carleton. Just the average house price. The Honourable Minister. 5.5 million Canadians lost their jobs, and they're all back. Member for Carleton. And what would they pay for the average house? The, the in 2020, unemployment rated more than doubled from a pre-pandemic level of 5.7% to a record of 13.7%, 6% now. Member for Carleton. I think there's a problem with the audio in the chamber. <laughs> the question was, what is the average cost of a house in Canada today? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government has made historic investments in housing affordability, and we will continue to do so. The Honourable Member for Carleton. And how affordable are such houses? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government has made historic investments in housing. We will continue to do so so that housing is affordable for all Canadians. Honourable Member for Carleton. If so, how much have house prices uh, increased since this government took office? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, let's talk about how it is possible for people to afford their houses with good employment. And that's why employment income fell by an unprecedented $28 billion during the, percent, or during the pandemic. The Honourable Member for Carleton. One last time, in dollars, how much have house prices risen since this government took office? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, consumer confidence is back. People are back to work. 106% of jobs have been recovered since the lowest point in the pandemic. The Honourable Member for Carleton. How much? Minister. From a steep decline in profits, we're back 66% since the bottom of the pandemic. Carleton. How much? Member. Minister. Mr. Speaker. The economy is recovering. Member for Carleton. Does the minister have any idea what it costs for the average person to buy a house in Canada? Does he have any idea or does he even care? Mr. Speaker, the, the minister helped more than 213,000 businesses stay afloat. Well, I think that the average Canadian can see how much this government knows and cares about the cost uh, of buying a home in this country, uh, which is 
their, their, their level of care is zero. I'm going to give him one last chance. Can he tell us what it costs the average Canadian, Canadian to buy the average house in Canada today? How much? Mr. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the CERB helped nearly 9 million Canadians who lost their jobs when COVID hit, making housing affordable for them. We will continue to do so. They hand him a speech that they wrote for him, a bureaucrat wrote for him, and he just stays glued to it. I mean, why don't we just elect a robot to read off these speeches that are written by bureaucrats in the finance department? Because that robot at least would stick more tightly to the script than he has. If he doesn't actually have any answers to the factual questions, is it possible that he could be replaced with a robot? <laughs> if that doesn't show you how little these politicians respect you, then I don't know what will. Which brings us on finally to the final I. Immigration. As I've said many times in the past, because all neoliberal Western nations have made it borderline impossible for their own young to start families without huge economic strife, said nations have had to import huge numbers of immigrants from wherever they can, in order to prevent the state from its inevitable economic collapse. Now, out of all the free eyes, immigration is by far the one that most people are likely to focus on. And if you were to ask people which they think contributes most to house price increases, I guarantee that this would be the one they'd pick. But the reality is, it's actually the least. Now again, supply and demand is business 101. If the supply of houses can't keep up with the demand, which immigration obviously increases, then naturally, this too will contribute in part to the huge increase in price. Yet during the pandemic, immigration worldwide took a nosedive, but house prices still continue to surge. According to the UK Office of National Statistics, from January 2021 to January 2022, the average UK house price went up by 9.6%. Yet the population certainly didn't go up by that same percentage. If immigration really was a major factor, then this logic simply wouldn't hold true. Make no mistake, immigration certainly does contribute to rising house prices. And if said leaders actually cared about their own people, they would instead make it easier for young people to start families so that their nations didn't need to rely on imported workers in the first place as I and everyone else with a brain have said many times before. However, clearly immigration does not affect house prices as much as many are led to believe. Could it possibly be that these same billionaire-owned media outlets keep creating artificial culture wars between different groups of people by constantly pushing identity politics based on religion, race, gender, or just plain political tribalism? Now make no mistake, I'm not making excuses for mass migration, the failed doctrine of multiculturalism, or any of the negatives that come with it. I mean, just ask these guys. However, what I am saying is that the anger towards immigrants is more often than not displaced. The truth is that the real battle today isn't Christian versus Muslim, white versus black, or male versus female. The real battle is between commoners versus elites whether people like it or not. Despite the differences between all of us, our struggle is ultimately one in the same. The struggle against the rapidly expanding corporate takeover of every aspect of our lives and the worldwide oppression that spawns from it. The first world is rapidly becoming a totalitarian dystopia, whereby nobody owns anything and we are ruled by the worst and most idiotic among us. And the third world is having its natural resources siphoned away alongside many of its greatest people due to brain drain. Make no mistake, dear viewer, this tyranny is global. Yet ironically, to defeat such global tyranny, we need to have a global movement ourselves. Unfortunately, the only people who even somewhat understand what's going on are the far leftists, who understand the economic issues, and the far rightists, who understand the social issues. Yet both of these groups of people despise each other due to only seeing half the picture. Trying to unite these two opposing groups seems like an almost impossible task, being as tribalistic and polarised as they are. But I am confident that so long as the truth is brought before them, then slowly but surely they will unite under one common banner. Putting their feeble differences aside to assist in what will become the most seismic event in human history the multi-decade-long cultural and economic resistance against such global tyranny. 
that, by the way, is already underway. Why you'll never own a house? Well, you might do, actually. If you're lucky enough to inherit one, or if you work yourself to the bone for the rest of your life, then you might just own one just before the ripe age of 80. To own a house is to own a small slice of our Earth, a place whereby you and your loved ones may feel safe and secure. But such a right is quickly becoming a privilege. Just ask your parents or grandparents how much easier it was for them and see what they have to say. Over the coming decades, the people must end fiat currency that is backed by nothing but illusions of grandeur. The people must end predatory billionaire investing, especially on necessities like housing. And the people must end exploitative mass migration that pits innocence against innocence. We must not allow the wealthy to buy up our world and turn us into serfs. Not now, and not ever. All right, folks, hope you enjoyed that. I don't know about you, but I am getting really sick and tired of these rich bastards trying to pull the wool over our eyes. But from my observations, conservatives seem to understand this situation very well, whereas the ones who call themselves liberals, progressives, leftists, whatever the hell you want to call yourselves, they don't get it. And it, that's complete and utter opposite day to how it used to be 10, 20 years ago. It's absolutely mind-blowing. It's, it's time to grow up. It's time to wake up, because this is absolutely getting out of hand. Now you can't afford a house, what next? Next they'll have you renting your toaster. A toaster where they charge you every single time you use it. Believe me, it's gonna happen. You watch. But anyway, I'd like to give my thanks to the Wall of Famers. And there's a lot of people here, I gotta say. Siores, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Any name with an X is very complicated to pronounce, and I know all about that, trust me. My Two Pence, Scrofulous Rex, Wes FR, Philippe M, Andrew Hamrick, Lyrana. Lyrana, you're the only person I've ever come across in my life who's given me money just to bollock me in a PM. But <laughs> besides the point, thank you very much. BW Gaming, name is still familiar, and Denton Cassells, don't worry sir, your secret is safe with me. Oof, my word, that was bloody difficult to make. You know, really, each of the three eyes deserves its own individual video. You know, this is like a, this is like a, a trilogy all in one, really. Anyway, I've got to go and collect some stones and some talons, so I'll see you next time. <laughs>